One of the fastest rising political parties in the early 1850s is in fact a party, a political party called the Know Nothing Party. Um, they were known as the Order of the Star Spangled Banner for true Native Americans. Uh, they were called the Know Nothings because uh, so it was a secret organization. Somebody would say, hey, do you know anything about this Order of the Star Spangled Banner? And they would say, I know nothing. Uh, and for those of you who are as, at least as old as I am, you remember the show Hogan's Heroes, right? And, and Schultz is like, I know nothing. And that's what I always think of when I, when I think of this term. But the Know Nothing Party develops very, very quickly in the 1850s. And it, uh, it's formed specifically in opposition to Catholic immigration to the United States. And it becomes, it catches on like wildfire, especially in New England. Connecticut elects uh, a know-nothing governor uh, in 1856, I believe. Uh, Maine is uh, heavily influenced by the Know Nothing Party. It's at this time where it's this opposition to immigration, opposition to Catholicism. They, uh, there's a huge uh, temperance movement that comes along with this because the, uh, the Irish and the Germans bring all their alcohol with them as though Americans weren't drinking heavily already. Uh, but the Germans at least bring lager beer, right? <laughs> so th this is all viewed as a threat. And so they come over in the 1840s, and naturalization period to become an American citizen and be able to vote occurs. Uh, it takes about a 10 to 12 year period at this time. So when you get to the early 1850s, that's when p the, the immigrants start to get citizenship and have the ability to vote. And they are viewed as a tremendous, tremendous political threat. Why does this say the Democratic Party on it? Because the Democratic Party is the one that is most welcome and open to the new immigrants. Uh, and they focus on capturing the immigrant vote. Uh, one of the other last things I'll tell you about the Know Nothing Party that is, is very interesting and helps us to, to historians to even better understand how slavery fits into this history during this time period. Uh, I had started by telling you that most Americans, uh, especially in the North, in the 1850s and into the early 1860s are not focused primarily on the issue of slavery. It's, it's hardly around them, really. It's, it's what they see in the newspapers, and, and they, they're periodically people, people speaking. But on the whole, somebody in Connecticut is not going to be confronted by slavery very often. And so what's really, really interesting, and, and this is what historians look at this, and they say, well, you know, the, the Civil War was uh, destined to happen because uh, you know, all, there were all these problems connected to slavery and, and sectionalism, and it was all over slavery. Everybody was focused on slavery, and it was the moral North versus the immoral South, and everything was coming to a head by the 1850s, and then you get the war in 1861, and that, that's just, that's the history. And then somebody says, well, how do you explain the Know Nothing Party in the 1850s, which receives a greater political attention and a higher political rise in the North than the Republican Party does in the 1850s? And in fact, the Republican Party does not win the presidential election in 1856 specifically because there are so many Know Nothing voters. People in New England and in the North to where all the immigration is occurring, and this is why New England is so know-nothing focused, is because so many immigrants are coming to our cities. Uh, not necessarily making their way all the way west just yet, but we have large immigrant populations in New York, in New Haven, in New London, in New Haven especially. And so when you look at it in this way and you say, uh, how do you explain the know-nothing party? Why, how? Because people are more influenced by what is happening in their own midst than they are by the slavery issue. And so no nothing rises very quickly. And then as problems continue with the South, no, I mean, no nothingism starts to go down, in part because they aren't able to get done some of what they say they're going to get done. They are a party that does a great job of campaigning and get, getting people excited, and then they don't do such a great job of governing. And so things fall off towards them. But Abraham Lincoln, for example, is, is uh, as I said before, he's a perfect example of this time period because when he's looking at the 1860 election, he understands that he must capture the Know Nothing vote. And he must do it in a way without alienating those who are opposed to Catholicism and without alienating those Catholic immigrants who have come over 
to the United States. So Lincoln walks a very fine line that some other Republicans do not, that they are really truly opposed to immigration, opposed to Catholicism. Lincoln plays this very fine line for it. All right, so on the eve of the Civil War, what was the role of uh, religion in the impending conflict? Uh, as I said, religion is the basis of the abolitionist movement. Um, most of the early abolitionists are uh, religious in some way, shape, or, or form. Uh, the uh, New England uh, Col the in New England Abolition Society, the American Abolition Society, both of those are founded uh, within churches. That's where they meet. Um, those are uh, social environments. And it is also one of the reasons that women become so heavily involved in the abolition movement. Because the one sphere that women are allowed to be involved in outside of the home is the life within the church. Because women are viewed as to be the, the sort of the, the moral backbone of the family. Family, and they're supposed to keep the family focused on their religious studies, and they can interact. Their women aren't supposed to go out and speak in public or, or necessarily even uh, work outside the home except for on the farm. Uh, and so the one area where they have some element of freedom is within the church. And so it's only natural that one of the things that they pick up on in terms of concepts of social justice is the abolition movement. And it's no far cry to understand that uh, the women's movement for more women's social and political rights and equality grows, in fact, out of the abolition movement itself.